Hi, I'm Dr. Lisa Harvey-Smith. I'm an astronomer at the CSIRO, and you're listening to my interview with Elaine Goodman on gogoodman.com.au. I read you dropped out of school at age 11 and decided to teach yourself. Was that your choice? Um, Yeah, well, my family um, gave me the option, actually, to um, go to school or learn at home. And uh, my brother and my sister were also given the same option, and we all decided to learn at home. So it's um, quite unusual. I think a lot of people don't realize it's perfectly legal to to be home educated, but it gave me the freedom personally to pursue the things I was interested in. And one of those things was astronomy, so that was fantastic for me. Even at age 11? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, as a kid, I mean, hopefully most kids have interests and um, interests that they, they find and develop, and some of them develop into nothing much and some of them develop into lifelong uh, sort of careers so for me it was it was fantastic I've discovered astronomy about age 12 actually and uh, just read loads and loads about it and, and was really hooked on it from that age so even from 14 15 years old I knew I wanted to be a professional astronomer where did your passion for astronomy come from I remember when I heard you speak you said your dad had an influence in this yeah, he did. Um, well, my dad um, was interested in everything, really, and we used to discuss everything from the weather to nature to philosophy, politics, um, religion. You know, we we had a we have a great relationship, and part of that sort of learning at home is about discussing the world and our place in the world. One of the things that he gave to me was um, a newspaper article about Mars, and it said you could see Mars um, as a a bright red star in the night sky and um, I had a look that night in fact I found it quite difficult to, to find it so we actually went to an op shop and bought a really old sort of 1950s uh, quite damp and smelly old uh, star atlas um, and we managed to sort of find the planet Mars after quite a, a bit of effort and um, my love for astronomy kind of grew from there. As a young teenager, how hard was it for you to comprehend the subject of astronomy and physics? Uh, well, for me, astronomy and physics um, were actually really cool. They were kind of like magic. Uh, when I was about 15, I, I, I won a copy of the, the book um, by Stephen Hawking, A Brief History of Time. That was a global bestseller about quantum physics and all these complicated things like string theory. And you know, I read it about ten times before I even started to understand it. But I found it really kind of magical, and and this mysterious world of science, this mysterious world of of uh, things smaller than you can see with a microscope, and then things bigger than you can ever imagine, like the whole universe. You know, all those all those things are really kind of magical to me. It was a bit like some people get lost in novels or you know, creative reading or writing or art. I got lost in physics. Did you have any friends that were similar to you like that? Not really. <laughs> My <laughs> friends took the mick. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was a bit of a weirdo, but um, no, it was it was, it was fantastic. I, I just really enjoyed it, and I, I didn't really mind if if uh, people thought I was a little bit strange. Sometimes you've got to go out on your own. <laughs> I feel you. That's <laughs> why <laughs> so I'm in here doing radio interviews. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you received a master's degree in physics and a PhD in radio astronomy, both through universities in England. What then prompted you to move to Australia? Um, honestly, Australia always seemed like a really nice place, just from the very limited exposure I had to it through um, you know, soapies and things like that. Um, <laughs> it was really home in a way that brought me here, but right. a bit more seriously, Australia's got a really good, um, not space program like NASA, but a really good astronomy program. So the telescopes that Australia runs are, are world class and um, it's got some really good research facilities. So I was really pleased to come over here, not only for a, a beautiful lifestyle, but also for the excellent science that Australia does in the area of astronomy. And also because of the, the Square Kilometre Array project that I'm now working as part of. Now, I'm going to try and get a little bit more complicated, but take it easy on me, right? All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Promise. Okay. You are a research astronomer that specializes in high resolution radio astronomy, which is the study of celestial objects at radio frequencies. What interests you about this particular area and what does it involve? Well, what it means, all that sort of of the complicated words mean that we are using telescopes to zoom in on very distant objects in the universe. So I look at things like stars 
and galaxies and um, they're very distant they're either in our Milky Way galaxy or even further away from um, thousands of light years to even billions of light years um, that's the kind of range we're looking at so very very distant objects um, you know billions and trillions of kilometers away so these things require telescopes to actually study them because they're very far away they're very small and um, so we use radio telescopes to look at the radio waves that are coming from these objects so what I mean by that is, is stars and galaxies don't just emit light they emit radio waves x-rays infrared ultraviolet and we use all these different types of telescopes of these different um, colors of the spectrum um, to measure different properties and different uh, physics of these objects and we're really trying to build up a picture of how the universe was born, how it was changed over uh, the 13.6 uh, billion years of its history and how physics really shapes the universe. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty big thing so that would take a lot of work. <laughs> pretty much everything <laughs> it's just a study of everything that's up there what um, kind of what what kind of cool objects have you come across that may have surprised you a little bit um, one thing I did in my PhD was um, I studied these things called mazes so that's like lasers but with an M on the on the front and the, <laughs> the, the L in laser means light and the rest is amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation all that means is uh, something shining very brightly in light um, these mazes that I studied in my PhD, they emit microwaves, so that's the M at the start of, of laser. Now, that all sounds sort of quite boring, but the context of this is these are shining from space. So these bright um, radio or microwave beams of radiation coming from space can tell us about how stars are being born uh, in the middle of our galaxy and um, they can also tell us about the types of chemicals in space so the ones I was looking at was quite surprising was um, a huge cloud of um, alcohol that, that we discovered in space that was um, hundreds of billions of kilometers across so it turns out there's all these chemicals in space and alcohol floating up there uh, which is kind of a good news for good news for humanity I think yeah, too bad Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin didn't know about it back then. I know, I know. I know if only they'd gone a bit further. So when, when you discover that, what's the next phase in using that information? See, for, like from my uneducated, not uneducated, but un, unknowingly point of perspective, knowing that there's alcohol in space, you can't really do much more with that. But as an astronomer, do you come to assumptions or further that research to figure out that people can you that people may be able to use that in the future, or how do you use that information? Well, there's a, the, the bigger context of it really is understanding how our universe works again. So, understanding what it's made of. So, we observe different gases in space. We observe hydrogen, um, helium, and the amount of carbon in space, and then the amount of things like alcohols. The, bigger molecules we can even see amino acids in space so that starts to tell us about the chemistry in space and the conditions from which the earth was built and if we can start to understand how the earth formed out of these these molecules and various other um, chemicals we can start to understand how life on earth um, came about and whether there might be life on other planets so that's really why we're why we're looking at the chemistry of space it also helps us to understand um, a lot about physics and a lot about chemistry more generally so it's a pretty cool thing to do not just about finding alcohol but pretty good <laughs> byproduct I'm so glad you have a sense of humor <laughs> <laughs> you got to in this job <laughs> in, in the back of your mind what would be your dream discovery when you sit down at night and get out your telescope what are you hoping or praying that you're just going to come across all of a sudden is it other life forms or is it some weird alien with a couple of heads or what do you what would be your ideal discovery well when we're um, we're doing observations with a telescope we normally have a plan in in mind so we're thinking well we want to look at this particular thing tonight so we'll tune it to a certain uh, color of light or a certain frequency of radio waves or a certain energy of x-rays and we'll look at a specific object it was kind of with an idea of what we might find and sometimes we'll find something really unexpected and that will change our ideas but some, some surveys now that we're doing with our new telescopes are literally just staring up 
um, and looking in new ways or different frequencies or different colors and just literally collecting information and seeing what we find, seeing whether we find unexpected things. And that's a really exciting part of science now because people are starting to find, astronomers are starting to find by doing this, really unusual bursts of high energy radiation that we can't explain. And um, you know, when you do that, you, you start to find really, really mysterious objects, um, some, of, some of which may be things falling into black holes or some of which may be um, exploding, you know, galaxies c colliding and large amounts of energy being pushed out. So things like that, really dramatic, explosive events in space can, can help us to understand what's out there and whether things like black holes uh, are actually real and behaving in the way that we hope. So, so it's kind of, it's, there's a range of things that we do, some planned and some very much unplanned. So have you seen all those things that you've mentioned? Have you seen them with your own eyes? Well, we use radio telescopes, so you can't see any of it with your own eyes. That's the, that's the magic. So you're trying to tune the radio waves from space and make them into a picture in false color. So you generally do that um, in a supercomputer environment and you, you've got to kind of interpret the results quite carefully because you're not literally just taking a photograph like you would with with a regular optical telescope you're actually recording wa radio waves that are invisible to our eyes so it's it's funny with the, the way that we interact with the data is quite different from how you might imagine it, it's funny that you mention these supercomputers from the footage that you see from neil armstrong and Buzz Aldrin um, landing on the moon back in 1969 and you see the control room down on Earth and there's about a hundred computers there all doing one separate thing. Now, a normal computer these days would do everything that all those hundred computers are doing back in 1969. So how, how has, does the technology advancement kind of amaze you as well? Yeah, absolutely. And how quickly is it advancing? The, um the the, uh, the computers at the time of the moon the original moon landings were just pathetic by today's <laughs> standards uh, and you know the, the the capability of computers doubles every 18 months or so um, that's called Moore's law and um, it's continued and continued and now we've got supercomputers dedicated to our radio astronomy studies um, one based in Perth in fact which is the largest um, research supercomputer in the southern hemisphere and we've got that number crunching right now doing you know, trillions of calculations for us every second and um, this is able to squeeze out so much more science than we used to be able to do. You know, when my PhD supervisor was doing his research he used to have a little pen uh, or a pencil attached to a, a little handle that would go up and down you know, he'd be <laughs> using a chart recorder and uh, he'd be drawing his uh, sky maps um, by hand using this pencil. You know, Now in my PhD Ten years ago, I was using pretty basic computers um, and number crunching that way. And now, you know, the PhD students of today are using supercomputers, and we're using these for our research and doing trillions of calculations, um, you know, in the blink of an eye. So it's, it's really moving on. And the next telescope that we're hoping to build will require um, a computer about 10 million times more powerful than your desktop computer to crunch all the data. So. Yeah, things are going very much more automated uh, in the big data direction. Will they will they be available through like Kmart and JB Hi-Fi anytime soon? <laughs> I reckon they would actually probably next year. I'd say. Oh wow! Buy, get yourself a supercomputer and uh, you know download loads of cat videos all at once. Or something. <laughs> you know, who knows? Well, they have like. Do you use three D computers at all in your research? Uh, uh, not three D computers. Three like D printers. Sorry. 3D printers. Uh, you know, I just saw a 3D printer lab um, at Swinburne University um, the other week, and it was fantastic. Um, we're starting to look at ways we could use them. Um, I don't personally use them in my research, but we are looking at ways um, in which they might be used, certainly in visualization. Um, and it's a really big topic at the moment, so uh, fascinating stuff. I'll watch it with interest. Australia has always been a big part of exploring the solar system with various telescopes and satellites and as you mentioned computers so more on the technology kind of side can you take me through exactly what our role has been since the moon landing in 1969 yeah absolutely so uh, I work for the CSIRO and we run this thing called the Australia Telescope National Facility so we run loads of telescopes around the country and some of those we operate on behalf of NASA um, which is a deep space tracking network uh, so there's a really big telescope, a few big telescopes near Canberra um, at Tidbinbilla. 
and uh, we operate those on behalf of NASA to actually track spacecraft whether they're landing on Mars or whatever the, they happen to be doing. We receive the signals and um, you know are able to tell NASA when the spacecraft's not on the side of the Earth, the same side as, as America. We we do that tracking for them. The other things that Australia does really well is, is actual astronomical research using telescopes. So we've got optical telescopes um, at Siding Springs, they're run by uh, the Australian Astronomical Observatory, and then the, the CSIRO radio telescopes all across the country. And we're helping to develop this next generation telescope, um, which is being invested in by 10 countries all around the world, called the Square Kilometre Array. And that array is uh, about 140,000 radio antennas, which are like the kind of a bit like the, if you imagine the, the TV aerial on the top of your house, things like that, 140,000 of those spread across the desert in WA. And uh, we're helping to develop and design that system as well. So, um, yeah, so Australia is really at the top of its game um, regarding radio astronomy and other types of astronomy as well. How did that relationship come about? Did, did NASA ask Australia to be involved? or? Well, I mean, that, that's been going for, have you seen the movie The Dish? Yes, yeah, yeah. And Patrick Walton. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, one of the best movies from Australia, I think, ever. Um, and, you know, that tells the story of the the tracking back then. I mean, it started in probably the 1950s or 60s, probably the early 60s. Um, I'm not sure how that relationship actually came about originally because I wasn't born, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think um, it's been a strong connection ever since because, as I said before, um, when the spacecraft isn't on the side of the Earth that America happens to be pointing in that direction, um, they have to use tracking networks in other countries to actually continually uh, work out what their what their spacecraft are doing, and to receive the pictures and signals and the scientific information from those. So uh, they've got a few networks around the globe for that. I saw an interview where you said it's an embarrassment that scientists don't know about 95% of what's in the universe. How do, you, how do you change that? I mean, how can humans discover what's out there faster than what whatever is being created or destroyed? Okay, so what, what I meant by that is 95% of the universe is this stuff called dark matter and dark energy. And this is stuff we don't know what it is, but it's uh, the dark matter is... Um, some sort of substance or some sort of physical effect that um, basically has a gravitational pull on everything in the universe, like all the planets, all the stars, all the galaxies. And this is this mysterious material out there um, that doesn't seem to interact with light. So it's, it's not a gas, it's not a particle, it's not a, a substance as, as you might imagine, um, but it has a gravitational pull on everything else in the universe. So dark matter, we don't know what it is, but we have to do lots and lots of studies of millions of, or billions of galaxies to understand its effect. And that that's like one of the biggest components of the universe. It sounds a bit confusing, and that's because it is. We literally don't know what it is, and the best scientists in the world are, are working on this problem right now. The other thing is dark energy, which is this equally mysterious effect whereby things in the universe seem to be getting uh, speeding up, getting more and more distant from each other. In other words, the universe is expanding and that expansion is getting faster and faster. So it's kind of like an anti-gravity effect. So one of these mysterious components is a kind of an extra gravity that we don't understand. And the other one is kind of an anti-gravity. So these two effects um, are really big, big questions and big unknowns in, in our understanding of our universe. So how do you overcome that? Will, will one, day, one day will scientists just, it'll just click or how do you study that when you can't really go and experience it because it's, I guess, so far away? Well, these two effects... And quite um, dangerous to go anywhere near. <laughs> well, we think these things are everywhere. So they're all around us um, and at least certainly around our galaxy. So what we can do is we can measure um, the motions this, of, of galaxies and stars in the universe. What, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll explain how um, we discovered the planet Pluto in the 1930s. Cool. We didn't discover Pluto by, it's not actually a planet now, but as you know. <laughs> I, I, thought, it, uh, I thought, didn't they reintroduce it, it as a out. planet? It's not a planet anymore. It's called a, a dwarf planet. Uh, but anyway. I thought they reintroduced it, it anyway. <laughs> Uh, let's call it a planet for now. So they discovered Pluto not by finding it in a telescope. 
but how um, it actually affected the gravity, by gravity it affected the motions of the other planets. So they worked out the orbits of the other planets very, very carefully and tracked their motions. And they added up all the gravitational pull of the Sun and the other planets on the planets Uranus and Neptune. And they said, well, there must be another planet because these, pl these other planets aren't moving around in the way we would expect. So they could infer from the motion of Neptune and Uranus that there must be another planet out there just tugging it slightly by gravity to one side. And lo and behold, they predicted where this planet must be and they had a look and they found it. So that's exactly how we want to tackle these bigger questions of dark matter and dark energy. We want to look at all of the galaxies out there in space. There are trillions and trillions of galaxies. And we will look at the motions of those galaxies, how they interact with each other, how they're moving. And then we can infer from that where the dark matter is and how much dark matter there is. And then how the universe is expanding and how much dark energy there is and try and understand where it's coming from and, and what it is. So that's kind of how we do it. We look at the motions of things we can see and infer what's out there that we can't see. Right, so does it ever feel like that you're not getting anywhere because your, your, your studies keep going in circles, I guess? I mean, it must be... It could get annoying at some stages when you just keep going, coming back to the same answer, but you just don't think it's right. Well, well how science works generally now, people work in big teams, so they're trying to tackle particular problems. So any individual scientist wouldn't go out on their own and try and sort of tackle one of these <laughs> Be problems. Be a hero. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no sort of heroes anymore, there's no Einsteins, but generally people work in big teams and they get a telescope and they say, let's do a long-term study of this effect and try and work out this exact thing about the universe. And then they'll do that project and they, they might do a different project on another telescope. So normally scientists have a number of different creative outlets uh, and a number of different studies going on all at once. So you wouldn't find many scientists who sort of fail to achieve anything in their career because they, they do sort of diversify and try try a few different things. And uh, if you don't find something, it can often be as interesting as if you do find it because then you, you've, you've kind of uh, crossed off one particular hypothesis about the universe, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's like narrowing it down. Yeah, exactly. Slowly, slowly, slowly narrowing down the entire universe. Science is taught as a series of you know, eureka moments and that's not how it happens a lot of it is very you know very boring it's like it's kind of like being uh, a lookout overnight lookout or something you're watching out is anything happening most of the time nothing will happen at all sometimes something exciting might happen and you know that's that's when it really comes into its its own so do you get like as an astronomer do you have like allocated holidays or are you always on call uh, no, you, yeah, I mean, we, we just work for government, so that's <laughs> just, you know, you get Christmas off. But most people, you, you find most scientists pretty much work all the time. Um, like a lot of people work very hard because um, you, you just love what you do. And that's, you know, if something happens um, over Christmas break, you know, there'll be people using the telescopes over Christmas, there'll be people working. And if something happens like a star explodes, everyone will be rushing into their computers and um, and and turning their telescopes to that object, definitely. Jesus, um, some, yes, of the, yeah. some of the great discoveries have been made actually on uh, public holidays. Um, uh, Ruby Payne Scott, one of the first um, Australian radio astronomers, uh, made a great discovery of a, a, a solar outburst, so the sun kind of, a big part of the sun exploded, and uh, she discovered that on Australia Day uh, <laughs> in the, the 1950s, I think it was. So, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of work um, pretty much 24-7. The other thing is uh, normal optical astronomy can only be done at night, but radio astronomy can be done during the day as well. So you don't need the sky to be dark because you're just looking at radio waves, not light. So we pretty much work all the time. Oh, just, pardon the comparison, but you're just like a journalist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The news cycle never stops. I met you at the town hall in Melbourne after Buzz Aldrin's talk, and he said in 2019 NASA wants to get a rocket circling the moon for the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. What will this achieve? Well, I think um, what Buzz was really talking about was a, a stepping stone to travelling to Mars. So, you know, you've got to walk before you can run and I think I think the idea is to 
um, establish the procedures and uh, America currently doesn't have any rockets to send up to people up to space so that's, that's one of the problems you need to develop that capability and then develop the ability again to land on the moon and then to maybe have a, a base on the moon so that you can have the support for those future missions that go further afield such as to Mars so I think that's what Buzz was really talking about was um, the vision of travelling to Mars and to have human exploration not only to um, find out more about the planet Mars, but also to develop the, the technologies, the capabilities, the life support systems, the next generation materials that could help humans to solve problems in other areas. So I think um, human sp space flight is a good thing in the sense that it challenges us as, as humans to actually go beyond our comfort zone and to invent things. I think that was one of the great uh, achievements of the Apollo program. You know, in some sense, it was a bit of a space race between um, two countries in a Cold War. But on the other side, there was a lot of um, technology that was achieved out of that program. So I think that's what we can aspire to. So <laughs> if we compare it to Earth, it's like traveling to Sydney and having a pit stop in Wollongong or something. Yeah, I would <laughs> say so. Yeah, you really want to make sure you've, you've built a tap and some some toilets <laughs> along the road that's you know that's essentially going to the moon is is a stop and it's um you know somewhere to stop off and have a coffee uh on the way to mars perhaps or have <laughs> have have a beer or something <laughs> yeah that'd be nice <laughs> with, with the intergalactic yeah, alcohol, alcohol in space. <laughs> we, can, we can organize that yeah <laughs> he also said that stephen hawking claims that earth only has 200 years left of existence does this put pressure on the astronomical community to come up with a solution like finding out if humans can survive on Mars? Um, look, I, I think Stephen Hawking says a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes they're uh, a little bit out there, but, um, you know, uh, the, way, the way humans are dealing with the planet isn't very intelligent at the moment, so it's uh, not necessarily a bad thing uh, to be able to uh, tra travel into space, but really there's, there's nowhere that we know of that could support um, you know, six billion humans, uh, and no way we could possibly save that many. So, I think we we should really focus on looking after the Earth a bit better, um, and and using the resources that we have more carefully, because um, the way we're going is is not great. Lisa, are you a religious person? No, no, I'm an atheist. Um, but uh, yeah, I I sort of don't. Yeah, I've never, I've never believed in a god. I've never seen a reason to. The reason I ask this is because there's always the debate about science versus religion. Do you think, in terms of creation, that they, those, both those opinions can coexist? Um, yeah, a lot of people are religious and scientific, and um, that's definitely something that can coexist. Uh, the fact that I'm an atheist it doesn't mean that I'm right, and doesn't mean that I, I think I'm right. I just see no evidence for a god and. Therefore, I don't believe in one. But you've got the scientific background behind you of how, and you said before you're trying to, like astronomers now are trying to figure out how the Earth um, was created. Once you've figured that out, does that destroy any religious um, belief that religious people have, or can they both no, coexist? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think a lot of most most religious people believe um, that. I think I don't want to put words in people's mouths but a lot of modern religious people believe that uh, God sort of created the conditions and the, the rules for for the universe and um, you know that that can encompass the physical laws that we're finding out through science and I think that's how they can these ideas can coexist the literal uh, sort of biblical um, translations of certain things like the earth being 4,000 years old that we know that's not true in my opinion that's put to bed <laughs> centuries ago so you know those literal sort of interpretations I think don't coexist with with science but the general principle that a god created the universe you can't refute that with science is, and you don't try to because there's no point um, that's absolutely fine if people believe that then that's absolutely their right and I don't want to try and stamp on that so um, I think science and religion can definitely coexist in that sense what's the big thing being studied at the moment we're getting so we're get, gradually getting closer to the end of the interview there's a few more questions left what's the big thing being studied 
at the moment, astronomy-wise? Is it, is it Mars? Um, well, there's so many things being studied around the world, astronomy-wise. Um, some people study the entire history and, and uh, kind of uh, development of the universe. That's called cosmology. Some people study planets. Um, there, there is no single big event. Um, you know, and, uh, I think that's a really hard question <laughs> to answer because there's actually um, uh, hundreds of professional astronomers in Australia alone and they're all studying a huge number of different areas. So we're pretty much interested in everything. One of the big areas recently has been discovering uh, planets around other stars. That's been exciting over the last couple of decades. And as I said earlier, these, these things called dark matter and dark energy, how they're molding our universe, and, um, and those things uh, are very, very interesting at the moment. So, yeah, <laughs> a huge range of stuff going on. I couldn't really prioritize it, but... Um, yeah, the, the stuff that gets a lot of publicity tends to be the, the things that NASA is, is doing because they have a fantastic publicity machine <laughs> and the study of Mars is, is really interesting. But most astronomers, actually, if you talk to almost any astronomer in, in Australia, they don't study planets. Um, uh, there's only a, a handful who study things like planets. Most are looking further afield at, at a, our own galaxy or other galaxies and a bit bigger to the, the, the larger scale um, picture of our universe and how it's developed over time. Similarly to the difference in language between Australia, England and America and the difference in slang, is the terminology different in astronomy or is there an international, I guess, ast astronomical language? Yeah, it's funny, funny you ask that. Cause there's, there's this big club called the International Astronomical Union and they decide all the language around astronomy so we try not to invent our own names for everything. <laughs> You know, if I could count the number of, you know, stars you could that I've ever discovered, it would be a lot. But that's not important, and we don't name them all. You know, John Star, uh, Mary Star, <laughs> Dave Star. It, you know, we could name them after our friends, but but that wouldn't actually be an official name. So this this big international club decides on the official names for things, and uh, again the official terminology for things. So, um, but you know the the. The slang difference is probably still used by uh, by most astronomers, but uh, the official names for things are quite boring, like J minus two o three five plus six four nine or something like that. So what's what's Pluto called now? Boring. What's Pluto <laughs> called now? It's like R U four o seven or something. <laughs> I actually don't know. <laughs> That's a really good question, but um, yeah, most people just call it Pluto. Does space need to be explored, or is is it being explored and studied just because it's there? I mean. Once you've discovered most of what you, once you feel complete in the knowledge that you know, how do you use that? Do you move humans to another planet where we can survive so that Earth, we stop destroying Earth? Or what do you do with all this research once, or if it ever does get completed, if that is even possible? Yeah, there's a few things there. I mean, the, you can't ever complete the study of the universe because we will because it changes all the time and we'll never know everything which is great because it keeps me in a job right <laughs> uh, but you know seriously uh, if we in terms of leaving earth if we destroy this earth and we move to another planet we'll just destroy that one as well so it's a I think we need to fix the way we think rather than the where we live uh, and, and and why we why we study space well you know if you're born in a small country town and you never left that town that's fine but you know, a lot of people want to see more of the the world, and and they want to scuba dive and discover what's under the ocean. And they want to climb mountains, and they want to, you know, fly to other countries and see see other cultures. And it's just part of human nature, I think, to to try and understand the world. And then there's the practical aspect, which is um, using astronomy as a sort of uh, laboratory, so using space as a laboratory to do experiments to understand how physics works, how gravity works. Um, We've made a huge number of great discoveries from, from looking at the stars, uh, including things like gravity and the, the laws of motion and uh, the speed of light and loads of other stuff that um, we now use in our technology on Earth, you know. So uh, it's, it's really quite remarkable that um, humans will never know more than about 1% about the universe, will never discover what's out everything that's out there will never discover um, everything there is to know so I think it's just part of human nature to, to keep exploring
Now, <laughs> I don't find you weird at all because you're a astronomer. I think it's kind of cool. But <laughs> the weird thing I, I do find about you is that in your spare time, you're an ultra marathon runner, which is basically running for days. What attracts you to this? Um, I, I like running. Um, I just find it sort of clears your mind and it's it's good fun and it, it's it's a good cheap way to get around. You know? So, <laughs> um, ultra marathon running is a funny old sport. There's a lot of it going on nowadays. Um, the longest race I've done is a couple of six day races. Actually, one was in the Simpson Desert, um, which was 250 kilometres through the desert uh, a couple of couple of years ago. That was really good fun. That was great because I, I could explore the desert and you know get out there and, and challenge myself uh did another six day race last year in in uh, canberra uh didn't even manage to finish that one but around 330 kilometers far out um, and so how, what's yeah, the average so, of distance you're running per day is it like you're running a marathon each day yeah well i've done yeah i've done a yeah marathon a day uh, i've done actually the most i've done is four marathons in one day uh, in a 24 hour race so that's pretty extreme as well but um yeah it's, it's kind of like one of those things where you're challenging yourself so it's fun in that sense but it's actually hideous while you're doing it so it's a funny old hobby but uh i like it yeah i'm not a big runner unless i'm chasing a ball <laughs> i don't know how you can run for days non-stop it amazes me <laughs> <laughs> it's just practice you can do anything you want if you practice <laughs> really <laughs> pretty, much. pretty much pretty much what's your aim what in your field of, uh, let, let me let me go back in my notes, in your field of celestial objects and discovering all these kind, kinds of objects, what's your aim? What do you want to discover or what's, what's the pinnacle at the moment? For me, the pinnacle would be, we're building a, a big telescope right now and the pinnacle is to make that a telescope that discovers something amazing, something actually transformational that, that could win a Nobel Prize. That would either be in the area of um, things that explode in, in space, unexpected objects in space, or understanding what dark matter and dark energy are. Those are the pinnacles. They're not personal pinnacles for me. I don't think I'll make those discoveries. But trying to develop telescope facilities that can make these discoveries um, and really understand something dramatically more than we currently do about our universe and um, that within my lifetime if we could achieve that I'd be very very satisfied indeed when you say um, it'd be cool if it won a Nobel Prize would that be your Nobel Prize or would that be your team's Nobel Prize well no it's, it's could be either neither or any of those <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter to me who wins it it's uh, you know it's a team sport there is 680 astronomers involved in our current telescope project Whoa. so it, to me it's irrelevant who who is awarded the prize it's um it's about what we find and what we find out and um you know the the nobel prize is a great thing because it spurs people on but it's it's really about recognizing fundamental and, and unexpected discoveries and if we can make one of those i think that would be absolutely fantastic and finally, where can people find you and follow your progress? Are you a big social media person? Is that big in the astronomy I industry? Yeah, look, I've got um, a website, lisaharveysmith.com, and uh, my Twitter handle is uh, Lisa Harvey Smith, all one word. And you can find me on Facebook as well. So, we, you know, we put a lot of our results online. We put up pictures and latest news so uh, yeah follow along it's, it's good fun and we like to share with everyone out there um, what their tax dollars are going towards so uh, please do follow along finally our tax dollars are being used for something cool <laughs> yeah Lisa this has been unbelievable as I said it's something I don't know a lot about but I feel like I know a little bit more and you've made it a little bit more easier to understand so thank you for doing the interview with me and I'd love to do it again sometime in the future You're very welcome great talking to you <laughs> Go Goodman, I like it.